Chapter 15 and 16, slides 9 through 20. Okay, so we've discussed mass spectrometry and how that can give us the mass of a molecule that we're investigating and sometimes even give us the molecular formula if we really don't know what molecule we're working with. What about other methods that use energy, the spectroscopy instruments? I just want to go over the energy scale with you to give you an idea about what we're dealing with. One of the instruments we're going to talk about is infrared energy. One of the instruments uses UV visible energy. And one of the instruments we're going to talk about uses radio frequency energy. So I want to remind you of the types of energies these deal with. If you remember in the first uh, set of slides, I also mentioned there are other instruments, one of which uses x-rays, right, x-ray diffraction. And if we think about what the energy can do to a molecule or even us, right, think about what the, uh, what, what's happening to the molecules in our own bodies when we get hit by different types of energy. So it's kind of good to remind ourselves, you know, how impactful some of these energies are. And I will remind you of a few physics equations that you may be familiar with. Um, the first one is related to frequency and wavelength, right? Where this V is frequency. And this is wavelength. Okay, now look at the relationship between frequency and wavelength. They are inversely related. So as frequency increases, wavelength decreases. And you can see that in these arrows above and below the, the scale, right? So as frequency increases, right, right over on that side, as it's going to the left, the wavelength decreases as it goes to the right. So we can see that and we understand it relative to uh, the equation. Energy, right, the energy of a given um, type, infrared or UV vis, has a direct correlation to frequency. So you could also say that as frequency increases, energy also increases. So energy and frequency move in the same direction because of their relationship. Okay, let's take a look at the different types of energies. In the middle, we have the visible. And we know this is the energy we deal with every day, right? You turn a, a light on, we're in the visible range. Visible light is not really damaging to us. So, you know, we're not too concerned with it. We need it to, to see. Now let's go up in frequency or up in energy. And what you'll see is the next highest energy we have is UV. It's very close to the visible. So the instrument called UV Vis uses the range of UV and visible light to probe the molecule. So, but understand that UV energy is much higher than visible energy. And so that is something that we have to be concerned with, as you know. UV, if you look down here, UV energy excites valence electrons from filled orbitals, bonding, to unfilled orbitals, antibonding. So we saw those types of orbitals in when you're doing molecular reactions. You're basically exciting an electron from a filled orbital state to an unfilled antibonding state, okay? that's going to be about 40 to 300 kilocals per mole in that range. That's the amount of energy we're talking about. That can cause skin, skin cancer, right? So we know that there are damaging effects to UV light, even on ourselves, because of this valence electron movement. That's just moving a valence electron from an orbital within that shell to another type of orbital, same within that shell, staying within that same shell. Doesn't sound like so much, but we know it causes skin cancer in some cases. Let's move to x-rays. Oof, now this is one to be scared about, right? X-rays, what does it do? It promotes electrons in atoms from inner shells to outer shells. 
So electrons move from say 1s to 4s. Oh my god, this is 300 kilocalories per mole or higher. That's a heck of a lot of energy. And that's why you wear the lead apron when you go for an x-ray, right, for your broken ankle or your teeth at the dentist. X-rays can cause a lot of damage because they're promoting electrons from inner shells to outer shells. Yikes. Okay, so X, so when you're moving above visible UV and X-rays, gamma rays, we don't even, you know, I don't even have a picture of the Hulk on this, right? It, <laughs> not that it turns you into the Hulk, but man, it can do some damage. It's so high energy that it's causing rampant um, processes to occur in your body that you just do not want happening. Below visible, what happens when we move in the other direction? When we increase our wavelength or decrease our energy or frequency? Now we're talking about things like the infrared. Infrared is actually the same type of energy used for your remote controls, right? And um, you can't point a remote control at someone and, and you know, scare them with the fact that you're going to blast them with some infrared energy. I mean, you can put, you know, you can point your remote control at your, your sibling and, and threaten, but it's not going to do anything. Infrared energy is much lower in energy, and it all it does is cause uh, molecules to vibrate and sort of dance a little bit. You're not changing its electronic configuration. You're not promoting electrons from inner shells to outer shells. All you're doing is you're making, you're giving some, a little bit of energy to the molecules, and they're they're bouncing, they're, they're stretching and bending and moving. So I, I call it like the molecular dance. You're giving it enough, you're turning music on and the, the molecules are sort of dancing. This is much lower in energy, right? Oops, we're, we're talking two to 10 kilocalories per mole here. It's not a lot. Again, we're, we're lower in energy than just light, visible light itself. What about radio frequency or radio waves? This is in the realm far, far, far lower than even infrared. And we're going to be talking about an instrument that uses radio frequency or radio waves uh, to, to excite the molecule in some way and we can observe its behavior. Look at the difference here. We're talking 1 times 10 to the negative 6 kilocalories per mole. This is very, 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 very low energy. but. Nevertheless, it still does something to a molecule and we can observe what, what's going on. So I just wanted to give you um, the realms of in which uh, some of these spectroscopy instruments work. We're going to be focusing specifically on UV vis, infrared, and the radio frequency range. Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start with reminding you about what each of these spectroscopy methods do. We've already discussed the mass spec, right? It gives us our molecular mass. And you should be able to recognize what a mass spec um, spectrum looks like and what the most important part of it is, right? The parent ion. We're next going to look at infrared spectroscopy. I want you to be able to look at a spectrum from IR and say, oh, that's an infrared um, spectrum. And I want you to be able to, on a fundamental level, figure out some basic functional groups that may or may not be present. This is what a typical FTIR or infrared spectrum looks like. Now what's interesting here is that the baseline is at the top of the spectrum. So this is your baseline right here. That's your baseline. The fingerprint region, which is very difficult to read, although it is like a fingerprint, it is um, very specific to a given system, is very tough, tough to read and for all intents and purposes for this course we're not really going to look at it. And that is roughly in this region right here. So what I'm going to tell you is that first of all you must recognize that infrared spectrum has a baseline at the top and I want you to read it from left to right. Because you're going to hit the diagnostic peaks 
much quicker if you read the spectrum from left to right. So if I'm scanning, if I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, oh look, there's a peak. This is important to look at. And then you can keep going, keep going, keep going. Oh look, there's another peak. That's important to look at. Keep going. Oh, here's another couple peaks. And then right around this region, it starts getting crazy. And I'm just going to attribute that to the fingerprint region. Okay. So what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about what's happening. Like, why do we see these peaks and what do they mean? The, I use the word diagnostic. This, this you can attribute to the ones that are the most telling or the most meaningful. Okay, the things that really stand out, that really help you out, the, the things, what's not going to help you out is the fingerprint region right now. It's just such a hot mess to deal with. We want the more diagnostic peaks, the ones that just stand out and are very easy to read and give meaning to what's happening. So what's happening in an infrared? As I mentioned, you put in some infrared energy to your sample, which has a molecule in it, right? Your sample's got your molecule. Now, infrared, spec infrared energy is just enough energy for a bunch of different exercises for the, uh, the bonds of the molecule to undergo. So imagine these um, molecules right here. You can see the first one here. This is called a symmetric stretch. This is when the carbon and its two hydrogens are literally just symmetrically stretching. Okay, I'm, you can kind of see how I'm doing that now. Or you might have an asymmetric stretch where the molecules, the, the carbon and maybe the two hydrogens are stretching, but they're doing it offset from one another. Okay. Symmetric stretch is probably one of the strongest ones to identify uh, on, and diagnostically on an infrared. So that's really what we're going to be focusing on. I want you to be paying attention to, mostly to the stretching. There are lots of other exercises that can occur though. We could have bending where, or scissoring as it's called, symmetric in plane bending or scissoring, that has a motion. Or you might have a rocking pattern, right? You might have the molecules rocking, or you might have them twisting, or they might be bending in a way that's wagging. So these also occur, and these bending and scissoring and twisting, these ones are tougher to read. These are the ones that you tend to see more often in the fingerprint region. So we're going to focus on just the symmetric stretches and the strong stretching frequencies that are attributed to the bonds um, when they're in this type of movement, the, the top two ones, okay? But just be aware that there are other types of bending vibrations, but stretching vibrations tend to be stronger and easier to read diagnostically on an infrared spectrum. So what's happening? Well, you, you throw some infrared energy at the molecule and let's just say it starts stretching. So let's look at a bond between hydrogen and chlorine. The way that it's stretching and moving and fluctuating is very akin to a spring with two mass weights on either end. The hydrogen being of a smaller mass and the chlorine being of a larger mass. And if you recall from physics, you can attribute Hooke's law of vibrational excitation to understand a little bit of what's going on. The key is to say that there's a frequency, right? A frequency of like this boing, 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 right? Of the spring bouncing right, of the stretching frequency, and its relation to mass, okay, so M is mass, so this is sort of like the weight of the atom, right, as if it was a weight, and K being the spring constant, and you can relate the spring constant to the tensity of the spring. If you have a really tense spring, then the frequency is going to be faster, Right? Notice that there's a, um, a direct correlation between frequency 
and spring constant. So as you increase the tensity, as K goes up, you increase the tensity of the spring, really tight spring, the frequency gets faster. As you decrease the tensity, make it make this make the um, the coil looser, like a slinky. Well, then it's going to be much, much, much lower in frequency. Okay, how about we keep the spring constant the same and we just change the mass? Well, as the mass increases, the frequency decreases. Because look at the relationship between frequency and mass. They have an inverse relationship. If you decrease the mass, it gets lighter, then the frequency increases. You can think about that from a physics perspective. Well, we see this correlation using Hooke's law within molecules themselves because of the vibrations that we're witnessing when we hit the molecule with infrared energy. So let's, I've got this reminding ourselves of this law up at the top. And let's remind ourselves that when mass increases, frequency decreases. I'm going to write this out. As the spring constant, the bond strength, increases, like you go from a single bond to a double bond, right? It's getting tighter and tighter. So as you increase the spring constant, bond strength, you also increase the frequency. Okay, so I've written this out. Let's look at the example of carbon bonded to a, an array of different atoms. So notice that I've got K is the same because it's a single bond. So K is constant, but I'm changing the mass of the atom. So if the mass is increasing as I move from hydrogen to chlorine, Right? The mass increases. I just stated up above that I should see frequency decrease. And this is exactly what you see. Frequencies, which are written down below in reciprocal centimeters, decreases. Very cool, right? We can see that trend. All right, now let's look at the second example. Here, I keep the masses the same but I'm changing K, I'm changing the type of bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. So what you'll notice is that as I go from left to right for the carbon-nitrogen case, as I go from left to right for the nitrogen case, I am increasing, oops, sorry, decreasing, I am decreasing the bond strength, right? K, the bond strength is decreasing. And we also see a decrease in frequency because they have a direct correlation. You can see that the number also goes down. So this seems to be working out. Now understand that, you know, you can change both the mass and the, the spring constant or the, the type of bond strength, um, and you'll get an array of different um, behaviors. But I just wanted you to see that this works out. This is what infrared spectroscopy is based on. It's just the bending and stretching frequencies of different bonds, given the type of bond and given what the atoms are. So what this says is that functional groups right? Carbon, carbon, double bonds, carbon, double bond, oxygen versus carbon, double bond, oxygen to a carboxylic acid, right? All of these different functional groups have very diagnostic stretching, bending frequency behaviors. And so if your molecule has a double bond carbon in it, you're going to see a peak that relates to that dance, to that bending and stretching frequency.
If you had an aldehyde, you'll see a carbon double bond oxygen bending or stretching frequency that is attributed to having that C double bond O present. So we're going to see these relationships of bonds and what type of functional groups may or may not be present due to the, the peaks that we're going to read on, a map, on an infrared spectrum. So here's an example. Let's say I had 2-butanol, and that's shown right here in the middle. I can list out, before I even look at the infrared, I can list out all of the possible bond frequencies that should be attributed to 2-butanol. Let's list them out together. 2-butanol has an O bonded to an H, right? It's an alcohol. It also has the carbon bonded to the oxygen. It also has carbons bonded to carbon, alkanes. And it also has carbon bonded to hydrogens. There's a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds, and they're all involved in alkanes. So, each one of these types of frequencies, and specifically the stretching frequencies, should be recognizable in this spectrum. How do we go about doing that? Well, don't fear. This is nothing to be memorized. This is a chart that I've also placed for you on a separate um, document so that you can print one of these out and have them next to you. This is something that is not memorized. It's a tool, just like the periodic table. You can have it right next to you as you're figuring these things out. So you have to learn how to read it. Let's go back to our spectrum and take a look at the X and Y axis. The X axis has the, wave, the reciprocal wave numbers. This is akin to frequency, okay? And then in the Y column, the Y axis, you have percent transmittance. And this is the strength of the signal. And I don't need you to pay too much attention to it other than the fact that, that you can tell that this is a strong signal. You could say that that is a weak signal. These are also um, where they are at on the frequency axis and combined with whether they're strong or weak signals is indicative of the type of bonds we're going to see. Okay, but it's not how much you have in there. It's not, you could have just one CO bond and be a strong signal. You could have 80 carbon-carbon alkanes and it'd be a weak signal. So the strength, it's just a part of its, its vibrational dance. Okay, so I don't want you to pay too much attention to the y-axis, but understand what a strong signal looks like and a weak signal looks like. I'm more concerned with um, the broadness versus the sharpness of a peak, right? Broad would be versus sharp. I'm also concerned with where on the frequency scale it is, okay? So these are the two big factors that you need to learn to read. Where on the scale is it? And how broad or sharp is the peak? Given that, and, and perhaps you can also, you know, see whether it's a strong or a weak signal, this will help you read what types of bonds are present for your molecule. You're going to see these as we move from left to right. You can again see that the most diagnostic peaks are to the left, right? So correct, I should say. So what you're going to be looking for are the types of bonds, right? And it, here's a list of all the types of bonds that you can have. And it looks like there's a typo here. This should be, oops, this should be a triple bond right between these two carbons. It's an alkyne. C, triple bond C. So you're going to be seeing these types of bonds, what type of functional group they can be attributed to, and these are the frequency ranges. So this is where they're going to show up on the x-axis of your infrared spectrum. You'll also see in parentheses a letter like S or V or M, and I have a, a, a legend down at the bottom 
V is variable, M is medium, S is strong, BR is broad, and W is weak. SH is sharp. So you can tell about the type of signal you're seeing, and then it tells you where or which type of um, exercise or vibration you're going to, it, it, that it's attributed to, like a stretch or a scissoring and bending, um, fingerprint region, uh, stretch. And again, I think, to me, I kind of think the fingerprint region for us is anywhere below 1500, 1400. Below that, I don't really think you need to look for stuff. It gets very difficult. There's a whole class dedicated to reading infrared. Um, we could spend, you know, an entire semester on infrared alone. I am going to get you through the basics, okay? I want you to recognize the most diagnostic, diagnostic peaks on an infrared and also recognize the absence of certain peaks because that's telling too. It's not just what's in there, but what's not in there that might be able to help you. So, if we're looking at this molecule again, as I mentioned, we should expect to see an OH from an alcohol. We should be able to see a CO from that alcohol, carbon-carbon alkanes and carbon-hydrogen alkanes. Let's go to our list here and see what we can see. I'm going to highlight them. I should be able to see CHs from an alkane in the 2960 region area. It should be strong. If you look the CH3 umbrella deformation, uh, that's below 1500. I'm not going to worry about that. I could also see some scissoring and bending in the 1470 to 1350 region and it's variable. I'm not going to worry about that either because it's below into the fingerprint region and I'm not worried right now. We also should expect to see a CO from an alcohol and this will be, oh look at that, it's also in the fingerprint region. That's going to be tough, a tough call. Although it is a strong signal, um, I may or may not see it. I'm not going to be too concerned about it. Let's see. I should also see a C, an OH for a regular um, alcohol, monomeric alcohol or hydrogen bonded alcohol. Either way, we're looking at a broad stretch that's strong in the 36 to 440, 31 to 3160 region. Okay, and what else? Oh look, carbon, carbon single bonds are not even in here. And you know why? Because they're in the fingerprint region. We're not even going to concern ourselves with carbon, carbon single bonds. Carbon, carbon double bonds and triple bonds, however, those we can actually see. They're, they're actually a little bit more diagnostic. They're actually a little bit more diagnostic. So we'll consider those, but carbon, carbon single bonds, not on my list. So using my chart, I know that a broad, this broad signal in the 35, it's about 3,400, I know that that peak is due to the OH stretch of the alcohol. I also know that these very strong peaks here, and they're just below, do you see this 300 line? Just below, th sorry, 3000, they're just below 3000, they're at around 2900 or something. These are the CH stretches of the alkanes. And I told you that you don't have to worry about the alkane CC double bond or single bonds. And the CO bond, we may or may not see because it was in the fingerprint region. And it said that the CO is going to be around 1260 to 1000, and it should be strong. I don't know. I mean, this is why it's tough. It could be one of those. But which one? I have no idea. So I'm just going to stop at that. Definitively, though, I can say that I have some alkanes and an alcohol. How many alcohols? I don't know. 
But given that I, I tested T2-butanol, I know that this is looking good for 2-butanol. But if I didn't know that this was 2-butanol, I could assess that there was an alcohol present in some alkanes, but I wouldn't know how many alcohols really and how many carbons there were and how things were attached, you know? So it's tough, but it does help us. And to my point, I might have had propanol, which is on the bottom, or I could have had 2-butanol, which is on the top. I don't know which one I have. Look at these. I mean, you can tell that the fingerprint region is very different, but on first glance, diagnostically, we can see they both have the OH stretching frequency that's broad and in the right region, and they both have alkane CHs, right? The OH stretch of the alcohol we can see that for each, and the CH stretch of an alkane, we can see that for each. They have the same pieces. They don't have the same number of pieces. They don't have the same pieces connected in the same way, but they have the same functionality. And so their infrared look very, very similar. So the problem is, is that we don't know connectivity or molecular formula. You'd be surprised, right? Two alcohols on the system doesn't look that much different. I like to draw a red line right up through the 3000 wave number and because when you're looking at identifying the types of CH stretching, so CH stretching is different when the CH is on an alkane, right, versus an alkene versus an alkyne. And if you draw a red line straight up and down at the 3000 mark, you'll see that just below the CHs of an alkane are just below that 3000 mark. When you start getting CHs just above the red line, just above 3000, those CHs are stretching because they're part of an alkene. If you have an alkyne, the frequency keeps increasing. And so again, with the look at where it is relative to the 3000 mark. That CH right there of an alkyne has a much higher frequency, and so you see it traveling. So I like to draw a red line to tell me about my alkane, alkene, alkyne CHs. And when you're dealing with organic molecules, you have a lot of CHs on the molecule. So I, I like to understand what types of CHs we're dealing with in a, in a given system. The other diagnostic peak that you're going to see is the carbonyl right? You could have a ketone, which shows up at around 1720. That's the C double bond O stretch. Notice what happens though when there's resonance. This is another term for resonance means conjugated. You've got two pi systems and they're, they're in resonance, so there's conjugation. They're talking to each other. That actually diminishes, that actually diminishes the frequency. So notice the frequency went down. Why? Think about the, the type of bond, right? If I moved to a carbon-oxygen bond, right? Let's compare. Let's go back to our chart. If you look at, let's, let's now look at a different set. Let's look at the carbon double bond oxygen frequency. It's got a range of 1760 to 1670. Look at the carbon oxygen frequency, right? The bond changed, but the mass stayed the same. So the correlation as the um, as K right goes from a single bond to a double bond. So as K increases, what's happening to the frequency? The frequency increases. Okay. Or conversely, as we move from a stronger bond, K, to a lower K, weaker bond, CO, the frequency decreases. 
So what we're ha what's happening is that CO versus C double bond O, this has a lower frequency. This has a higher frequency. And we did that using Hooke's law, right? So if you have resonance, remember that the double bond of the carbonyl when it's in resonance is not really a double bond and it's not really a single bond either. It actually starts falling in between. So what happens is, is the frequency of a double bond that is totally isolated and has no resonance is 1720. But if resonance can occur, then you're, you're weakening the tensity of that double bond. It's not really a pure double bond anymore. It's kind of being shared over a greater, greater area. You'll notice that the frequency starts dropping. So it tells you something a little bit about whether there's resonance happening or not and how that relates to the frequency. Okay, I also mentioned that there are some signals that are broad and some signals that are narrow or very sharp. We would typically just see sharp signals, right, if, if, all, if, if there were no interactions between molecules. But if you recall, we have things called hydrogen bonding interactions, right? Here's an ethanol molecule. Here's ethanol. Ethanol can interact with another molecule of itself through this hydrogen bonding interaction. Right? There's your H-bonding H, H interaction. Yikes. And now they're, they're strongly um, associated with each other. And uh, imagine if you're on the dance floor and you're strongly associated with a bunch of people around you. It's going to change how you're dancing, right? It's going to change your vibration frequency and what you're allowed to do. And so what happens is that this varies the frequency to a great extent such that you start seeing broadness in the signal. So when hydrogen bonding is occurring within the molecule, with another molecule of itself, given the sample, then you start seeing broadness. If the alcohol doesn't have any association with another alcohol and there is no hydrogen bonding interactions, you will see a sharp OH signal. And you can see that here. There are sometimes sharp signals attributed to OHs that just can't, maybe there's too much steric hindrance and they can't hydrogen bond. But if they're free to participate and open for hydrogen bonding interactions with other molecules, the signal broadens. So we see that in, in this example here. And that's why we get those broad peaks. What about functional groups that are sort of compounded functional groups. Take carboxylic acids, for instance. I think this is probably one of the more um, widely recognized patterns that we can see. What do you expect to see in a carboxylic acid functional group? So here's the functional group. The whole functional group, you should anticipate a C double bond O stretch. You should anticipate a C O stretch. You should anticipate an OH stretch. And that about does it, right? So there's your, those are the three major uh, bond connections in a carboxylic acid. So let's take a look at our chart. Where do we expect to see the C double bond O stretch, the carbonyl? Well, if you look on the chart, the C double bond O stretch should be in this 1600 region. And we can see that right here. There's our C double bond O. We should also see an OH stretch. Now remember the CO stretch was down in the 1000 to 1100 somewhere in here. I don't know where that one is. That one's tough. So I'm not I'm not going to worry too much about that one because it's tough to, to really find in that fingerprint region. Sometimes it pokes through and it's super strong, but if I can't see it right off the bat and identify it among a bunch of other peaks, I'm not going to worry about it. But I can see the C double bond O stretch. That is diagnostically on its own right there. How about the OH stretch? Well, if you'll notice in the chart, there is a difference between the OH stretch of an alcohol versus the OH stretch when it's involved in a carboxylic acid. They're different. 
they have different ranges. And because of resonance, right, because of resonance, it changes K. This makes a big difference. Two things here, OH can be involved in hydrogen bonding, so it should be broad, and the OH of a carboxylic acid has a bond association. The oxygen can be involved in double bonded uh, situation because of the resonance, and so that's gonna change the frequency drastically. So the range for a carboxylic acid OH is actually right almost on top of the 3000 mark. Okay, not 3,500. So an alcohol would normally be broad around here, but what we're seeing is that the OH of carboxylic acid is broad around 3,000, not 3,500. So what does it overlap with? It overlaps, can you see these peaks peeking through? See those little guys? The little ones peeking through, those are your CH alkane stretches because those are right below 3,000. And so what you're getting is an overlay of both the OH stretch for carboxylic acid and peeking through, you can also see the CH of the alkane. It's a very um, diagnostic pattern for a carboxylic acid. What about other functional groups like amines? Well, amines can also hydrogen bond and so they can be a little bit more broad. They don't hydrogen bond as strongly as oxygen because it's not as electronegative, but we still see some broadness. And for every hydrogen on the nitrogen, you see its own peak. So if I had a primary amine with two hydrogens off of it, I would see two NH peaks. If I only had one hydrogen off of the nitrogen for the amine, I would see one mildly broad peak. And again, it, it conforms to the region that we is, is predicted in one of our infrared charts. So I want you to read an infrared spectrum from left to right. Understand that the signals are going down. The baseline is at the top. And I want you to become familiar with recognizing uh, a, a pretty decent group of functional groups. You should be able to identify, oops, CH alkanes in the 2960 region, CH alkenes in the 3000 region, just above, CH of perhaps aromatic rings and CHs of alkynes. These are diagnostic. Okay, C double bond C, uh, we're getting down into the fingerprint region here. Alkynes are actually diagnostic. Of the carbon-carbon bond stretches, the only one that's really easy to spot is the alkyne because it's high enough in frequency that we can, it pulls itself out of the fingerprint region. All of the carbon double bond uh, carbons or carbon single bond carbons are in the fingerprint region and hard to find, but alkynes are high enough in frequency because the bond is stronger, so we see it at 2260. Um, carbon double bond oxygens, that's the big one. The aldehydes, the ones that are in aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, and esters, we're going to see that in the range of 1670 to 1760. Alcohols, you know, of any variety, whether they're part of the carboxylic acid in the lower region of the 3000 region, or if they're just part of an alcohol and they're higher up in the 3640 region. Nitrogen hydrogen bonds like amines, those are easy to diagnose as well. Carbon nitrogens, those are much lower and harder to find in the fingerprint region. Carbon triple bond nitrogen, those, like carbon triple bond carbon, are diagnostic as well because they're high enough in frequency to be seen. Nitro compounds, eh, they can be a bit tricky, but they have a much lower um, frequency stretch. So sometimes if you know that you're dealing with a nitro compound, you can maybe pick them out. But I've highlighted in yellow the things that you're going to be very good at spotting. And it just takes a little bit of practice. You want to answer the questions like, do I have an alcohol or don't I, right? So you almost want to go through a check. 
you know, the things, do I have an OH, right? And is it an alcohol? Or is it part of a carboxylic acid? There's a difference between having a ketone with an alcohol at the other end of the molecule versus having a carboxylic acid. These are very distinguishable infrared spectra. Think about what differences you'll see. So we'll be able to decipher between different functionalities, right? You want to ask yourself, do you see or not see the presence of a carbonyl? Right? Do you see or not see a carbon double bond carbon type of hydrogen? Carbon triple bond carbon type of hydrogen? Or just regular carbon hydrogen of an alkane? These, these are the things that you're going to predominantly be looking for and not much more. In fact, if you look on the internet, you can find uh, books with pages upon pages of tables for different functional groups in different situations and what the infrared frequencies are gonna look like. And very, I've given you um, a very broad chart with big ranges, but things can get focused and dialed in a lot uh, more precisely as you study this, this type of area of instrumentation. But you'd be amazed to see how just what I've covered so far alone, how far you can get in analyzing a spectrum. It's pretty incredible and kind of fun, right? So this is one more piece. Now think about it. You might now have the molecular weight. Maybe you have the formula for a molecule. Maybe you even know the degrees of unsaturation. Add to that, some functional groups from the infrared. What might be present? What definitely is not present? That's just as informative, okay? So understand maybe degrees of unsaturation, maybe what the formula you're working with is, and what functional groups may or may not be present. We're getting closer to identifying our unknown compound.